Are you sick and tired of getting beaten by little kids on chess.com, getting the dirty flags all the time from positions where you have two queens against one pawn? Well, I'm Grandmaster Max Lingworth, and I have a really great solution for you in this video. You see, there are two main ways to win on chess.com that don't involve the dirty flagging. The first one is in the suggested video above of winning with tactical sharpness and good calculation. And the second way that I'm going to show you in this video is the more positional and strategic route where you're able to outplay your opponents more on good understanding, technique, and good positional play. Or for those who, who want another way of putting it, good strict chess strategy. Illingworth Chess, improve your chess. So let's get into our game for today. Our game for today is between Vladimir Fedosev against another strong GM, relatively young guy, uh, Mohamed Tabatabai from Iran. As is from the Tile Tuesday Blitz event of 2021. Before I get into that game, do make sure to smash that like button if you enjoyed this video. So the game went e4, e5, knight to f3. So the step one is basically to pick an opening, which is kind of like sort of a semi-system opening. You, know, you don't have to play like the London and just play the first 10 moves every move. But what you can do is you can sort of play what I like to call an opening scheme, where you sort of put your piece on similar squares against most of the lines or have some very clear-cut structure where the plans are quite straightforward. For example, for those who have seen my 60-second Italian video, you're going to note after bishop c5, it's very easy to play like castles, d6, c3, and moves like rook e1, a4, knight bd2, a3, put a knight on g3. It's all you can do almost without really thinking, and you're going to be pretty sure that in like 98% of cases that this is going to be a very good option for white to play this kind of setup. But in the game, black played bishop e7, try and be a little more creative and maybe have the option of playing a d5 push at some point. I guess that's why I played the move knight to c3 here, uh, even though I think that castles and rookie one is a little bit more critical. But Fedosev is a very creative Russian GM. He likes to put a little bit of fight on the board. He often goes his own way in the opening. And with knight to c3, I think he wanted to get his opponent out of fury and just do play chess from here. The game went d6, and now I think that white should maybe have considered a move like a4, uh, and actually after a3, this sort of leads us to an important point if you are going for a win in a game, especially if you're playing a lower rate player. That's on my step two to suggest for you guys. It's basically to create some sort of imbalance in the position. By creating that imbalance, it gives you a, a potential advantage that you can work with and also be a potential opportunity to outplay your opponents. Uh, you know, say it's making it that it's not just they can just play solid moves, just hold a solid draw with white or with black. Okay, it's true, a lot of you guys who play Blitz, your opponent's going to hang pieces anyway, so this doesn't apply quite as much. But it's still good to keep in mind that there are ways to win beyond your opponent just making some random blunder. If you do want to improve your results, do make sure to hit that subscribe button and ding ding the notification bell uh, to get my videos in your feed. And when you have subscribed, do make sure to comment below with I'm subscribed so that I can personally welcome you to our Illingworth Chess family. So with that being said, the move that Black could have played here uh, is to move knight to a5. And it's the reason why I want to play a4 before, because now, after bishop b3, you are going to lose that bishop pair to knight takes b3. You know, I guess Black at castle first, you know, wait to see what white does, and you're even to move like c6, because by delaying the move knight b3, like, and not just making automatic recapture, well, we're not giving white that easy open file for the rook, and it's going to keep white guessing a little bit. It means that they're more likely to make a mistake if they don't know exactly what it is we're going to do. So I'm keeping those cards a bit close to your chest, keeping your options open can make it more likely that your opponent will sort of misjudge what your idea is or like make some kind of mistake. Uh, so in any case, the game went castles. White corrected his earlier little slip with a4. And now black played a6, which I don't think really does all that much in this position. I think instead I would probably just go bishop e6 and... There's a very instructive point as well, like it's obvious continuation of step two about like creating the sort of imbalance in the position, you know, something a bit asymmetrical. Because in a symmetrical structure, not a great deal is really happening at the moment. But if let's say we have bishop takes e6 and f e6, well those double pawns are actually something of a strength for black here. Because A, you've created this open uh, H uh, f file for the rook. You know, potentially you could put your knight on f4 later and try to create some attacking chance against the king. And also, you can support moves like d5. Like now you have a central majority where if they do play e takes d5, you can take back and you have a very nice space advantage for your two pawns side by side in the center. 
So it kind of shows that, you know, black is in pretty good shape in this kind of position. If pressed, I'd probably prefer like a move like queen e8 and going to knight f4, playing to d5, but obviously both plans are very much legitimate here. But instead, black played a6, and after castles, then he played the move bishop e6. But I mean, if you're going to do this, like, why not do this and move earlier? We can kind of see that black played a6, not really understanding that a4 had this very useful point that allows you to meet knight a5 with bishop to a2 and keep the bishop on this long diagonal, where it's not really obvious what the point of a6 is. Like, it's almost like saying, oh, I'm just going to play, like, some move, like, to some random move and hope that you put a piece on pre if I just, like, you know, shuffle randomly. But, of course, this high level, that's not going to be the case. So bishop b6 was played. And yeah, how would you deal with this tension between the bishops? You know, if you watch my video on like win, uh, how to win on chess.com, you're going to know that one of the steps I mentioned there was about how to basically judge who's going to benefit from different exchanges. And we kind of really saw how bishop takes e6, how that position kind of played out. So what would be your move that you would play as white? So for this one, you can put in a comment below if you want to, the move you would play in this position. Because when you actually type the comment, it actually helps you to improve a lot more quickly with your chess when you are actually are responding, like actually having to say to moving on to play, rather than saying, oh yeah, I, I saw that move, Max. Like it was all part of the plan, the move you said, like absolutely. When you put a comment, you know, you can't cheat yourself. So the move I would play is why it would probably be to play Rook to E1. You know, just kind of a solid move. Make it hard for him to go D5, because now if they do play D5, we can take back and you can kind of see here that we are, you know, hitting the d5 pawn, so black would be losing a pawn in that case. Uh, but if black goes bishop takes c4 instead, then it's sort of a, again, instructive point that you often see in these kind of e4, e5, sort of quiet, pianissimo sort of lines, is that the dog pawns can often be a strength, because those dog pawns have given white a nice open d file, so we now have a good pot spot for our rook. It also means we can kind of support a knight on d5, and it'll be really well anchored by the white pawns. So I would go as far as say I think white is just a bit better in this position, because I'm not quite sure what Black's plan is if he's not going like F5 or something. I'm not really sure what he's doing here. Uh, I've only known him sitting passively and begging for a draw. Uh, but instead of, you know, letting Black go beg for a draw, you know, it's all like being a dog, like, you know, begging for a bone or whatever. Instead, I play Knight D5. And that's not a bad move either, actually. Because if you're able to play like C3, B4 and kick the Knight, or even just to play C3, D4 and get those pawns as center, you know, White's going to have a very nice advantage. So it's definitely a move that really puts uh, a lot of demands on black. And after bishop takes d5, white played e takes d5, wanting to keep his bishop pair alive. Obviously you don't want to take with the knight here, because then you're going to run into a fork uh, with e takes here. So that's why black gives up the bishop pair. Now after e d5, knight b4, at first glance, it might seem like white has blundered here, that there's no way to defend the pawn, and so white's just losing a pawn, right? But Fedesev had seen a bit further, and he realized that by hitting back in the center with d4, he could actually keep his pawn alive. Uh, how exactly? Well, if black were to play knight takes d5, for example, we can take that pawn and, you know, we can gobble, gobble, gobble. And after knight takes, we see that white's got the bishop pair. He got his unopposed bishop, a bit of pressure on that f7 pawn if black were to move the knight away. And that all adds up to just a very pleasant positional advantage. Because when you are playing blitz chess, like, you don't necessarily need to, you know, find some genius moves. So I'm just playing good, simple chess, just, you know, taking the positional advantages like the bishop pair or the space or the material advantage when they give it to you. Often that can be enough, you know, to set some problems, ask some tricky questions and get them to make mistakes that we can punish to get the win. So it's all about just accumulating the advantages with this more strategic way to win on chess.com. So that's kind of step three, basically step three to after building the imbalance is to find a way to basically turn that imbalance into an actual advantage. So maybe, for example, you have the bishop pair, but you have doubled pawns, then find a way to go either undouble those pawns or turn those doubled pawns into a strength, maybe open up the position so your bishop pair gets better and better. Well, black played the move of e4 in this position, trying to, you know, defend the pawn and then take. But after knight d2, what we see here is that actually black is not yet ready to just grab that d5 pawn for free. Because if you play knight b takes d5, white well, has a nice little tactic that allows him to keep the advantage. I'm not going to spoil it just yet, because we're actually going to see it in the game as well. Uh, I think that the best move for black might actually be to play something like b5, trying to deflect that bishop away so that if white were, let's say, to try to take on b5, well, in this case, we'd have takes, captures, 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 and, you know, we're even hitting the bishop and the pawn at the same time, so this is kind of bueno for white, and black gets you know, a nice central majority as well. Uh, but instead, black played the move of uh, rook to e8 in this position, and... 
Now White played a very nice move C3, and you're probably wondering, well, Max, what's the point? It's like, after knight BB5, isn't black just winning a pawn? Well, maybe you notice that white can win back the pawn with bishop takes d5 and knight takes e4. But then you're giving up your bishop head, get the pawn back. And so you're not really getting any sort of advantage there. But often a trick works like, let's say you're looking at some combination, maybe some kind of tactical sequence in the position. And one little grandmaster ninja trick you might like to keep in mind is to ask, well, what if I play the second move of the combination first? Like instead of going A, B, go B and then A. Sometimes that little shift, well, it won't just allow you to make viral music videos uh, and songs, but it may allow you to find the best chess move as well. So knight takes e4. Using the fact that black knight was overloaded defending the pawn and defending the knight. And if you did take, then it's going to be even worse for black. You've got the fork on the pawn and on the knight. Well, it's got the bishop head of boot, so it's just very uh, sad, sad for black. So black played move c6 to build defend his knight. White kept the knights on the board with knight g3. And again, this sort of, you know, harkens back to, you know, the thing I covered before about the uh, the peace tension in the previous How to Win It on Chess.com video. But I want to go a little deeper and sort of point out a concept by Mark Varetsky, considered by maybe one of the greatest chess trainers of all time, you know, from Soviet Union, worked with most of the world's top 100 chess players at one point, that's top 100 chess players in the world. And so you realize that, well, if you were to play knight takes f6, well... Those black knights were kind of a bit tangled, sort of, you know, treading on each other's hoofs. And now black is sort of able to say, well, now my knight is on the one good square. I can go d5 and just have a very solid position. Where white's bishop pair is not really bringing that much utility. So by playing a move knight g3, what Fedosev is doing is saying, well, both your knights kind of want to be on that d5 square, but you can only put one of them there at a time as such. I mean, yeah, you could try like recycle, like go back and forth, but then you're going to get mated in the process. So in this case, you know, the knights are sort of a little bit disgruntled. You're wondering, hey, you know, I've been serving my king loyally for a long time. Give me a pay raise right now, or I'm going to go full Robin Hood and start robbing the rich. In any case, after knight g3, black played move b5. And it's sort of a point where it's kind of like you could say, well, sort of a step four of winning on chess.com is like just keep up your positional advantages and kind of provoke them into making some sort of weakening moves. Also moves that like I say some bad exchange. Just basically kind of entice me making some positional mistakes. And you don't necessarily have to do it like sort of in a very forcing way. So I'm just putting your piece on good squares, just kind of attacking their weaknesses. Can be a good way to kind of get them to lash out in some way. It's like, I'm not going to stand this. I'm not just going to sit passively for the rest of the game and let you know, do whatever you want to as such. I'm a human and I have feelings as well. Uh, but instead of B5, I think they're playing Bishop F8 and maybe trying to fiend carry the Bishop. Might have been a better try because... By playing g6, you're stopping white getting that knight to f5, and you know, with the distance for that knight, it's merely a little bit misplaced at the moment. Okay, to be fair, white is still better. I mean, you can still go h4, and you can try to whip up some attacking chance on the king. But with the bishop on g7, at least black is managed to sort of stop the bleeding and keep things somewhat under control as such. You know, that's the power you know, of those coagulants, as it were. But instead, we have the move b5. White played bishop to b3. I mean, bishop d3 is also possible, but they're both nice diagonals for the bishop. Uh, black played bishop f8, you know, trying this idea from before. I mean, because white has this unopposed bishop, you know, we could call it the Italian bishop as such, and who doesn't love, you know, Italian food. Well, black would play knight to c7, and then he could try to go d5, you know, try to, you know, get his uh, his knocky all, all set in order to challenge the bishop. But yeah, I mean, white would still be a lot better, you know, queen f3. Knight f5, like, white's got a big initiative, but at least you can try to put the pawns all on the light squares so that white bishop is not going to be all that much of a powerhouse. But yeah, after bishop f8, white played bishop g5. And I mean, it's a kind of annoying pin. You know, I think that black's next move was a mistake. The black really should get out of this pin ASAP with queen d7. You know, white's still much better. You know, queen f3. You know, actually, it's a sort of instructive point. You probably don't want to play rook e1 and fight for the open file because... If you think about it, black doesn't really have a good entry point down at e-file anyway. You know, if we sort of draw a little traffic light here. Okay, it's kind of a bit wrong way around, but we'll make do of it. Well, I mean, in this case, like, if you play rookie one, black can sort of just trade off the rooks. And with every trade of these pieces, it kind of makes his space disadvantage a bit less of a factor. So by keeping the major piece on the board, it keeps our, our powder dry. It keeps our ammunition for an attack, like with h4, h5, you know, knight f5, and trying to, you know, create some threats in that way. So that's kind of an instructive point that you don't necessarily want to put the rook on the open file if your opponent has no entry point anyway. So it's better just to keep the rooks on the board when you've got the initiative and you've got that control of the game. 
But yeah, eight six unfortunately was a very serious strategic mistake. I think that Black just got impatient and just got sick of like these bishops, you know, just crisscrossing with the pins. And it's like, no, I'm sick of like being pinned down. You know, I'm not a pin cushion. You know, just I'm not like I'm a prime minister that people hated or president that people hated. You know, where people buy a pin cushion and put the pins in to take out their frustration on the policies. No, I'm just a chess player. Like, stop pinning me all over the place. Unfortunately, this runs into a really nice move. Let's see if you guys can find it. Can you find a move that Fedese have played in order to achieve a decisive positional advantage? The dream of Anatoly Karpov, Magnus Carlsen, and Akiba Rubenstein alike. Well, for me, my dream is for you to smash that like button if you're enjoying the video, so that I can make more videos like this one. But actually, the key move is bishop takes d5. If black white didn't have this move, black would kind of be doing alright, actually, if the bishop was forced to retreat, or this one was forced to trade. But here we take advantage of the fact that none of black's captures really do that much for him. Like, h takes g5 is running into bishop takes c6, uh, forking the two rooks. You can't play knight takes d5, because then your queen is on pre to bishop d8. So not only really c takes d5, but now, after the move bishop takes f6, we see that the fixed pawn structure immensely favours the white knight over the bad black bishop. You know, this bishop's been a bit of a naughty boy. And now after a takes b5, a takes b5, and now the move queen b3 was played by white. Not the engine's first move, but I mean, you are still winning a pawn, so who really cares? I mean, you know, it's not really a good way for black to defend both these pawns at once. One thing he could try is he could try to play some move like queen to e6. With the idea that if white were to go queen b5, you'd have rook b8 and you could try to win back your pawn on b2. Unfortunately for black, white is a little intermezzo with rook takes a8. Rook takes a8. And after queen takes b5, white's just up a pawn. He's going to maneuver that knight around like knight e2 to f4 or maybe even knight f1 to e3. And that's just no really sensible way for black to defend this pawn. Meanwhile, the past b pawn is just going to queen one day. And you know, this is our dream of every white pawn to eventually have a sex change and become a queen. Uh, okay, obviously, you know, the piece they don't have, like, uh, you know, a human identity in that sense, but you get the idea. Uh, so we had rook a to b8, white grabbed the pawn with queen d5, and, you know, the rest was basically just a matter of technique. You know, basically after we looked at step 4, you know, provoking black to create additional weaknesses and additional concessions, then step 5 is just to cap it all off, to keep your focus, you know, just because you're winning doesn't mean that, you know, you should fall asleep at the board or just assume the game's going to win itself. So don't go, like, checking Facebook or, you know, watching some random YouTube video while, uh, you know, while you have a winning position. Keep focused. Just only focus on this. And, you know, don't fall for your opponent's cheap traps. And you will eventually close out the full point. But keep thinking until they resign. So, after G6, we have the move Rook Fe1. You know, it's kind of a point that White's quite happy to trade off the Rooks when he's got the Queen and Knight against the Queen and Bishop. Because the bishop tends to tag team better with the rooks, whereas the knight tends to tag team better with the queen and such. Uh, in any case, we had the move b4. And white just played rook takes c8. You know, b4 is kind of a bit of a desperation move. Uh, actually, better say missed a little tactic. He could have played queen to b5 and, you know, managed to take that pawn on b4 without doubling his pawns. So that would have been a little improvement. But even after c to b4, white is still clearly winning. You know, the pass pawn is still a pain in the neck for black. The game went bishop g7, white console with rook d1, and actually I think rook d1 is a little bit too passive in this position. You know, you can see that first has been a little bit careless, is giving black some chance to potentially create some counterplay. So I think it's much better in this position to play for the initiative. I mean, who cares if they get d4 if you've got a winning endgame afterwards? So I would play rook a8. You know, it's again the principle I mentioned that you want to trade the rooks when you've got the knight against the bishop, because, and you have the queens on the board, because in this position the queen and knight are going to have much better harmony than the queen and bishop, because the queen and bishop are kind of, you know, both on the dark squares, but that leaves the light squares a little bit uh, tender. Whereas in this case, we can kind of see after queen d5, that, you know, white's knight can easily kind of move around, you know, attack the pawns, move on both color complexes, where black's kind of, white's got, you know, both the color complex on a good control, whereas black only has one. And if black does take that pawn and try to salvage the ending, unfortunately, white's just winning this position. You, know, you can even play a move like b5, because... If black does go pawn grabbing with bishop b2, we're going to play b6 and, you know, black can technically bring the bishop back to stop the pawn queening, but after you go knight e4, like, white is going to position the knight, you know, like, you can either take the pawn this way, or if black tries to save with bishop b8, we're going to go knight f6 and, and we're going to go knight d7 and just win the bishop and, and easily win the game with the extra piece from there. So we can kind of see that, you know, black just doesn't really have a great answer because, if you give white time, let's say to go knight e2, put the king in the center and just blockade on those 
Light squares, you know, the past B pawn is an outside past pawn, which is a million miles away from the Black King, so White would win from this position. It's there where I played Rook D1, and you know, Black kind of maybe had given up, was maybe a little bit too defeated at this point, and that's maybe why he missed his opportunity to play Rook B8, which to me seems like a pretty obvious move, you know, attack the past pawn. You know, I can try and hang on to the pawn, but it's not so easy, because after Queen C4, for example, Black can go Queen E7, and suddenly he can start to go after this pawn, and if Black does take that pawn back, he's hitting D4, and he's going to be hitting B2. So I think that Black might actually be able to save himself, even though he's currently two pawns down. Because in that case, the opening position will start to be quite nice for the bishop versus the knight, uh, as it were. You know, B5, Queen B7, it's not... It isn't really a good way for White to save this B5 pawn, as it were. Uh, but instead, Black played H5, which doesn't really do that much. You know, just Knight E4, and you know, you've got the fork here with the Queen and the Pawn. Now, to Queen F4, this does set a little bit of a trap, which Fedosev didn't fall for. The trap is that if you were to take that Pawn, you're going to run into a self-pin with Rook D8, and then you're actually losing the Knight by force, because obviously the, the Queen is defending F7 here. So I played Rook E1, just keeping things defended. You know, Black doesn't have the move F5 because the Pawn is pinned. So Black played King H8, and White just played Rook E3, just making sure that F5 is going to lose its sting, that we can just take on D6 and, and Black has nothing. Uh, and actually F5 is the move that was played in the game, and actually turns out 96 would be a mistake, because if Rook takes E3, so if you saw it well, you improved on a Grandmaster, congratulations, put that on your gravestone after you die. Uh, but it turns out White does have a few good moves to deal with this. In the game, Fedosev played the move G6, uh, if you came up with knight g5 or knight f6, that's also technically winning. But g3 is pretty straightforward. I mean, if black were to try to, let's say, play queen h6 and keep that queen alive. Well, it has a lot of winning moves here. I mean, knight d6 is good enough. If you want to show off, you can also play knight g5 here. Where you're either going to take that rook on the next turn. Or if they take our rook, we're going to play knight f7. And, you know, we just do a knight fork to win the queen. So then we come to basically like step, let's say, five and a half of how to actually win and convert the advantage. Just find a couple of nice little tactical tricks like this in order to keep control of the position, squelch their counterplay, and just win the game. And that's indeed what happened after Queen E4. Rook E4, Rook E4, like the white just up way too much in material here. And he won just by queening a pawn. So he played the move Queen to C7, stopping Bishop D4, and you know, it means if Rook takes D4, the white can go B5 and just basically queen the pawn, just pushing it all the way down. And we can say, push him, baby, push him, baby. But instead, the game went king to h6. And now the d-pawn is the one that the queen's in the end. Bishop d4. d6, like black's counterplay is just nowhere near sufficient. After d7, there's nothing to really stop white queening on the next turn. You know, rook f2 is just kind of... It sets up discovered checks, but not really more than that. And therefore, Tabat Tabai uh, resigned in this position. So there you have it. Those are the key steps for winning on chess.com. Let's just do a quick recap just to make sure that we're all on the same page here. It's good for me as well, because I just forget what I say half the time. So, a good reminder for me as well. So, the answer is that step one is we play some sort of opening, just like some system opening, where we can kind of just play natural moves to sort of play to a kind of opening scheme, so that we can play our moves quickly and get a bit of a time advantage on the clock. Step two is then to look for some kind of imbalance in the position, which White, or to create some imbalance in the position, which White did by playing knight d5, you know, in fighting this position where White had the bishop pair, but black managed to double White's pawns. But then we saw the step three where White was able to turn his sort of disadvantage, like to liquidate his disadvantage or to maximize the value of his advantage. He kind of did both with this idea of d4 and being able to you know, play the knight e4 trick where he wasn't just able to undouble his pawns with this sort of tricky exchange of pawns, but he was also able to open up the position for his bishop pair because it makes sense that the knight is generally stronger in a more closed type of position, a more fixed pawn structure, whereas the bishop is going to be a lot better in general in a more open type of position with the bishop being the archer and the knight being the swordsman of the chessboard. So up to c6, yeah, we saw that like step three, well, it was basically to, well, we can't talk about step three, actually. I'm ready, I can't count to, to four. But step four is basically to play in a way where we just kind of keep control of the position, just keep putting our piece on good squares and let them, you know, make the concessions like pawn to b5 and weaken themselves in this kind of way. And then finally, step five, like after they made all these weaknesses and, you know, completely atrophied their pawn structure, well, then in that case, it was just basically step five was showing good technique, giving a good control over the position, and finding a few little tactical tricks to stop their counterplay and basically win the game. So that's basically the summary of how to win on chess.com. Do make sure to like this video if you enjoyed it, and also subscribe to the channel. Uh, and I will see you guys in the next video. Peace.